good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Zoetis uh, Lunch of Seminar. Uh, I'm Akihiro Iwakuma, uh, Director of the Technical Service uh, at the Zoetis Japan. Uh, so uh, the today's uh, objective is uh, to uh, share the information on CAF and uh, HEFA management, uh, particularly by focusing on the control of uh, bovine respiratory disease, uh, BRD. So uh, we Zoetis uh, provide uh, BRD solutions for our uh, customers through our uh, services and uh, products, uh, which are uh, vaccines and, uh, and uh, antibiotics against the pathogens. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Just Nodheisen, uh, Emeritus Professor of Utrecht University. Uh, he is the one of the <coughs> WBC keynote uh, speakers on herd health management, uh, the famous uh, man. So um, briefly, I would like to uh, introduce uh, his biography uh, first. Uh, he was born in Netherlands. He graduated from uh, Utrecht University and was a uh, professor of University Wageningen. I don't know if my pronunciation is correct. Uh, then Utrecht University after working in private practice. Then after working, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, as a guest professor of Belgium, Belgium and uh, France, and I had uh, today, uh, he retired professor of Charles Stewart University. So uh, we would like to have time, uh, sorry. Uh, so we, we, we will, uh, would like to have time for presentation. Dr. Justin Oldhuyzen. Let's Thank you, uh, Dr. Yakuma. Dear colleagues, bon appétit. <laughs> I have to say it because uh, I live in France now. Uh, you, you might be confused seeing here Australia <coughs> and here down, but this is my last day <laughs> uh, for the Australian work. But I continue in the, uh, the other consultancy area, which is named uh, France and uh, Portugal, and further abroad. Today I will try to take you along a particular aspect of dairy, heifer and calf management. Like Dr. Iwakum was saying, it's about BRD mainly as an example. And we have put two languages on the screen to please as much as possible the participants present here. Makes me hungry seeing you eat. <laughs> I will give a short introduction and then focus on the BRD complex and followed by animal health options available right now. Just a first brief introduction on dairy hotels and productivity management programs where, of course, calf and heifer rearing is a major part of. We have seen earlier that there are three pillars in herd health and productivity management programs. The routine monitoring of several aspects on the dairy farm. The second one, spe specifically linked to problems and problem analysis, where usually a lot of risk factors and risk conditions come into the picture. Those risk factors can be used to turn it around, try to reduce their impact, or try to eliminate them altogether. Usually it's a compromise, what is feasible in management and what is not. If we speak specifically about vaccination schemes and drugs available 
for example, to treat BRD complex, vaccination schemes is an integrated part of the veterinary herd health and productivity management programs, but on a, I dare to say, a more justified basis. Because if you implement, for example, vaccination programs on a farm which is member of, I'll try to call it like this, member and subscribed to those uh, herd health and productivity programs, the veterinarian who is applying vaccination at least knows the farmer and the conditions on the farm, including potential risk factors. When such programs of herd health and productivity management is not implemented, you still can have a look to those two components, but the implementation will be much harder because then you have no idea about the risk conditions which are prevalent and maybe not even know very well the farmer. It's feasible, but there are constraints. Let's look a little bit further. The BRD complex. Sincerely, I hope that you have attended to the first lunch seminar of Zoetis, where Victor Cortese and his colleague have entered in much more detail in the fundamental aspects of the disease and the treatments. I will not do so. I will try to stick to the field as much as possible. Different agents are involved. The primary ones and a whole bunch of potentially other agents active in a certain situation. The disease signs are easy to observe, of course, if you know where to look for. And there are several degrees of severeness of the disease, depending on which moments you are observing, of course. The disease complex can be complicated by an involvement of mycoplasma species and monaemia species. But preventive measures and treatment are available. The option then is what to do when, with what, and how. That's the question which often returns in the field. Let's take a short look to the dynamics, starting with the herd. If there is a low environmental contamination, that means a low exposure, and potentially only susceptible calves are affected. So the result is a few clinical diseases. As soon as the affection burden increases, the, expo the exposure increases, leading to the calves being affected as well. Due to the higher environmental contamination, and you have a disease outbreak. So there are two levels in the field where to look. And that's again where monitoring comes into the picture. If you have a close look to the herd which you are visiting regularly, then in your routine monitoring, you keep an open eye what is happening at this level and you should prevent what's happening here in one way or another. There are, for example, scoring systems, clinical scoring systems available. We heard uh, in this conference a presentation about body condition scoring. The purpose of that paper was fully different from what I intend to do in the field because I want to know whether the number of infected calves or affected calves is increasing. One 
over 50 or more, which uh, show the signs of the BRD complex, is maybe a first alarm. It's very good if you observe it. But it c can mean anything that you want. But if the number is increasing, then the yellow card comes up. Alarm phase one. And you should, of course, avoid that there is a red card coming up. By the way, for the Japanese people, you earned a lot of golden medals in the uh, Asian Games. Congratulations. Clinical science, wherever you go, whatever scoring cards are being used, these are always the same clinical signs which are the major ones and the most important. This, of course, is rectal temperature. A score normal, that means that such things are not present, not visible at least, or not observed. And for temperature, of course, when you put a score zero, it means that the temperature should remain lower than 39. And everything else with different score figures, and there is where the discussion starts. Why should we give a two here and a four there? That's a matter of debate. Personally, I don't think it's important at all. The point is that you want to observe that there are abnormalities which may lead to action. That's the importance from a veterinary herd health point of view. In this case, with this type of figures, if the sum of these observations is more than five, then most probably a BRD problem is present and you have to confirm the diagnosis and take action. But for field use, for example, the College of Veterinary Medicine in the, in the US has developed the same type of scoring approach, but at least not only for the vet, I would say if you train the farmer or the manager, he is very well able to do scoring as well. He needs training. Of course, it would be much handier if the farmer is doing the scoring while you are coming to the farm, say, once every month. There's still a lack of four weeks in between, and he could observe an increasing number of affected calves in, the, in that four weeks. So scoring one, uh, zero, one, two, three, and just find out which type of sign is available to score. The score is three. For the most heavy signs, I would say you are rather late in dis discovering it. I would prefer to move to the left side for the first signs which gives the first alarm situation. To have a closer look and have a look to the animals more frequently, so not once every month, the farmer comes into the picture, but daily. Very helpful to uh, assist in the determination of the BOD status in the herd. Major risk factors identified in various countries. Animals with no previous vaccination history. Seems uh, rather obvious to me. A poor overall appearance of the cattle. That is a reflection of general farm management quality. Remember that calf and maiden heifer rearing is one of the production units of the farm. So it deserves a lot of attention because it's the investment in the future. Poor overall appearance of the cattle is a sign that maybe you should increase the monitoring frequency if the farmer is not doing anything. Doubtful source of calves, maiden heifers and cows. 
if a farmer buys in cattle, wealth age groups ever, from another farm or from different farms, it's possible that he doesn't know anything about health status on those farms. If there is no certification, that means there is a certain level of risk. What level? Unknown. So either he stops it to solve that problem, no more purchasing, or he installs a quarantine unit before mingling those animals with his own herd. During transport, a lot can happen, shipping fever, but also at farm level, mixing different age groups, very well known for the BRS virus, for example, from old cattle to younger cattle. A BRD history of the source farms, doubtful, long transportation distances, then we talk about more the shipping fever issue, season of the year as a risk factor, and a low body weight at arrival, because the, say, the farmers who are selling think if I transport for the purchaser 50 calves or 100 calves in one transport, then I can save feed. And if that takes a long time for transportation, the body weight is low, meaning that in principle the general disease resistance will be lowered as well. Animals may become more susceptible. The effect in zootechnical parameters, for example, at least two weeks delay to the first calving in the dairy. And that's an average figure with, of course, the variation around it. Four to eight percent of milk loss in the first and second lactation. Some animals never recover to the fullest, so it could be more. In survival analysis, about 110 days lesser longevity. Cows are culled earlier. An estimated total economic lifetime loss of about uh, 880 euros or in yen. This is to be put between brackets. But there is a relationship. I will not go into that detail and stick to the BRD complex itself. Animal health options. Roughly speaking about vaccination and antibiotics. A recent study in the Netherlands from the Department of Animal Health Economics, which has done a lot of work in, uh, in production animals with regard to economic losses and diseases and economic decision making on the farm, have pointed out that whatever you do, vaccination of the young stock is always economically beneficial. At least that's a positive starting point. There is no discussion of when, how many years payback will occur before the break-even is attained and there is a, a positive outcome. No, the outcome is immediately positive given the loss components if there would be a VRD infection prevalent. There are various types of vaccines on the market, which makes it not easy for the practitioner to make immediately the right choice on his farm. This is, for example, an uh, international IBR vaccine, which is used in Western Europe. I put here the marker vaccine because it's part of an eradication program. The marker vaccine may make the difference in diagnosis to know there is a field virus going on in the herd or it is 
the, the vaccine virus. It's to avoid that animals are killed who are not at all infected. We have always to do with false positives, false negatives in our diagnostic system. So we should not eliminate the false positives. That's why they use the intranasal marker vaccine. Different countries have different mixtures. It depends on policy, I would say, either at the farming community, veterinary community, or maybe even at the higher level, FDA, etc. Ammonemia, the complicating microorganism, is available. In the USA, there is a so-called, with, with the emphasis on so-called, vaccine for Mycoplasma bovis on the market. I have never found in what literature whatsoever a report on efficacy. So at least for me, that points a question mark. How it comes that's on the market, that's another issue. Imagine that you get in your mailbox a advertising about uh, such Mycoplasma bovis vaccine, and you know now that there is, in my view, not any efficacy report, I would suggest that you should be careful about it. I'm not saying it do, uh, it's doing nothing, but I say it, be careful. For antibiotics, two examples. The Drexin, Clutatomycin, and the XNL or XCD, Nexel, whatever you call it. Also, that depends on the continent or maybe even country with the safety of four. Nexel. Let's have a closer look to those because maybe we make the same remarks as for, for this one. This vaccine, vaccine, international administration, I come to that, but probably you have heard already in the other luncheon uh, seminar, the pluses and minuses, indicated for youngsters, but also for adult cows, if it's appropriate. So you have to know if it's appropriate. You have to find out in the herd. One major characteris uh, characteristic, Temperature sensitive, and that's the reason that it's intranasal use. Repeat yearly for calves which are vaccinated uh, at a young age. You should do it uh, twice to keep up in the in the booster level. Apply to prevent shipping fever, and can even be applied in early disease outbreaks. That's because. We will have a short look into that in the internet nasal administration. For example, the characteristics coming out of repeated studies. Nasal discharge interferon is the present within 14 hours after administration, with peaking at three to four days after administration. It goes much quicker than in other uh, administration uh, routes. Local cellular response and specific antibodies, IgA, IgG, from local, very important, from local B cells, contribute to optimize immune response. There is something going on locally, rather rapidly, to counteract the potential action of the virus. For example, when you want to search for antibodies in the serum from eight days onwards. So that's the difference between the two, the internasal 
and whether it would be intramuscular. No nasal interferon was present when vaccination was intramuscular. So you lose time. After challenge by EM, serum antibodies were detected 24 hours later. This is an experiment outcome. Local B cells producing the IgA and IgG have a high mucosa affinity, acting directly there where the virus enters which is an advantage. The BRD viruses are also associated with other viruses, but that goes too far to see what is the combined action of those viruses in, uh, in, in this example. I like to take you along some field studies because it's much closer to the reality, say, than artificial experimental studies. All already in 78. No difference in serum antibody response, systemic response between challenges internasally or intermuscularly. Serum. Leukocytes after the international vaccination inhibit apparently the RBR cytopathogenic changes due to the high local interferon levels. You gain time. As we have seen in the other slide, IgA, IgG present after the internasal, after intermuscular vaccination, only IgG detected. IgA is a very locally active uh, antibody. The conclusion was that interferon is slowing down the virus replic replication until the IgA and IgG take over. After challenging in this experiment the intermuscular vaccinated cattle, the respiratory tract problems were much more severe than after internasal vaccination. I think you could add due to the time lag that is between the, the two responses after vaccination. How is the situation in different EU member states? Quite different. For example, Germany is free of RBR in 2017, last year. Basically, a test a kill strategy. Still, there are outbreaks, although rare, because still animals are moving around. Animals are bought still. So there is still a risk very, uh, present. Belgium has installed a compulsory program. The west of Belgium, Flanders, was in 2017 for 63% free. Monitoring still continues and the program still continues. Application of a marker vaccine coupled, I would say, of course, coupled to a biosecurity plan. As long as you are not totally free, you should do that coupling to avoid that you get repeated reinfections and that the er er eradication goes too slowly. In the Netherlands, compulsory program 2070 with the goal to be free in 2020. Bulk milk tank tests, blood test, application of marker vaccine, killing and biosecurity plan. The Netherlands have started a program years ago, but due to a certain contamination in the marker, uh, in the, the vaccine, all farmers dropped out, a lot of economic losses, and they spent years to come over it and be again open for starting a new eradication program. 
currently 60% free, 20% infected. Early program was stopped due to the contamination by a by BVD virus. In France, no program and visits. Let's not discuss about reasons because it will take the whole afternoon. In a compulsory program, test a herd sample. If negative, test the whole herd and start applying biosecurity measures. If positive, vaccinate all the cows and kill. If young stock is positive, vaccinate everyone. That's very roughly the skeleton of a compulsory program. This is not a panacea. It depends on farmer demands, government requirements, availability of support, availability of sufficient finances, for example. And the role of the dairy plants and the farmers' associations, specifically in Netherlands, plays or played a paramount role, both in the first one, in the 80s, as in the second one. Because not all farmers are prone to start such a program. But you do it, and you do it all together, or you don't do it. In the last case, the risk is too, too heavy. Example of such uh, biosecurity measures, keep the dairy farm closed. No importation of cattle, and that is twofold, not from outside the country, and not from inside the country, from other farms. You might ask, what the heck does this part do here? Some farmers get manure from neighboring farmers as a fertilizer for their land. Corn, for example. That should be stopped. And no commingling of cows, not in pasture and not in the barns. Holland is a small country, high density, so the distance between farms is not, uh, not long, and the contact between neighboring farms could be a uh, transmission factor. No visitors, hygiene barrier at the farm entrance and in the barns, putting requirements to professional visitors as the veterinarian or the AI technician or the nutritionist. When pasturing cattle, make sure that it cannot make contact with other cattle of wild deer, meaning that small canals between two pastures, one is farm A, the other pasture is farm B, it's too little. So fences should be uh, made wider away from each other. Use your own machinery. In different countries, there are cooperatives only for machinery. You subscribe and you can use that machine which was used yesterday by another farmer. But if outside machinery must be used because you cannot afford as a farmer to buy every machine, then you have the objectives of dis uh, disinfection before entering your own farm and when leaving that farm. For cars, trucks, and materials of professional visitors, it's the same thing. Maybe a farmer installs a parking place outside the farm. When a cattle restraint box is used, clean and disinfect it daily. Do not use semen from uncertified institutional sources. It's obvious, I think, already for years and the vets should use one needle or nozzle per animal and not try to save money because it's a false conviction. The financial issues, <coughs> calculated on a farm with 100 cows and 60 young stock, average economic loss to the prevalence at that time is 25,000 euro 
or so much on Japanese yen. Vaccination costs 5.3 euro per head or per cow in yen. Cost of vaccination for this farm. And why should they do it? Because farms free of IBR and BVD show an 8% better feed efficiency only. They do not have the milk loss. And overall, you have 85 euro per cow per year more benefit. So it's worthwhile doing so. For other countries, other conditions, the calculation undoubtedly will be different. This is just an example to show that it's feasible from an economic point of view. About other products, which may help if it is truly a severe outbreak. The vaccine, based on the bacterium toxoid, prevent complications of respiratory disease. That's why a veterinarian should know the history and the health status of the farms where he is operating. Best effects when vaccination is done sometime after the first vaccination that we have seen earlier. Again, you have to know the herd infection level, so monitoring is still in the picture. And it fits into the routine monitoring of routine herd health programs. Another product, for example, the Draxin BRD complex, available here in Japan since 2016. The concentration in the lungs, a ground advantage, is higher than in plasma. Within 15 minutes, which is the same advantage as the intranasal vaccination. Long-lasting protection, subcutaneous injection for young stock. For men, be careful. It's like the prostaglandin. Be careful with that as well. If you are a female and you are pregnant. Cure rates, that's important for us. In already infected animals, nearly 80% cure rate and lesser mortality. Based on the fact that it has a kind of immune stimulating effect. Because even the vaccine itself against mycoplasma, it does something against mycoplasma. We don't know how it works exactly, but at least you could say it might be a stimulator. The cure rate when also mycoplasma is present, so we are treating infected animals, it drops a little, but still it's quite acceptable. Based on the question that was raised in literature, a study was done to see whether different age groups of calves have different cure rates. No difference was found at all. In high-risk calves, that means not yet infected, but risk factors largely present, the incidence didn't pass the 10, 11 percent, but it was worse when mycoplasma is present. So mycoplasma is still a shredding co-agent of this. Another field trial, just to give you an idea, about 800 calves in a young group. They came from different uh, rearing units, six, 56 days of observation, which is already longer than, say, the, the usual experimental groups which are under study shorter time. Overall prevalence, 12% BRD. This was a randomized, 2013, randomized clinical field trial, treatment group versus control group. The score chart that we have seen in the beginning and added a neurological scoring chart, which I have not shown. Which diseases were observed, a whole bunch. Treatment, Draxin, overall mortality rate at the end of the study, 
2%, and maybe other information is even more saying. The different diseases that occurred in that uh, group of 780 calves and the percentages in each disease group, so to say. I make a sidestep because in literature, even for practitioners, they speak about the risk ratio or the odds ratio. This seems to be a complex slide. Let's move slowly. Smoking and lung cancer. How can I easily and roughly calculate the risk ratio or the odds ratio? Well, I just make my observations and I found, in this case, humans which are smoking but do not have lung cancer. I put them there. The ones that are smoking and have been diagnosed with lung cancer, I put here. But not everyone is smoking. So the people that are not smoking and have diagnosed with lung cancer, I put here. And no smoking, no lung cancer, I put here. And then you can calculate the incidence of lung cancer with the risk factor, smoking, and the incidence of lung cancer without the risk factor. But it gives the calculation of risk factor at population level. I will not go into detail, but it is easy. And it gives, in this case, an odds ratio, 4.16, meaning that people who are smoking have four times more risk of being diagnosed with lung cancer than those who are not. And you calculate confidence intervals more or less comparable to p-values of statistics, more or less, maybe even less, but still valuable. Let's forget this box and move to this one. What would happen if I just cross-calculate this? This will be done here. With lung cancer divided by this and uh, divided by uh, the no smoking and no lung cancer here. And it yields an odds ratio of 4.2, which seems rather nicely compared to the official one. So why bother in the field? We just make the four groups, calculate, and we have a figure. Meaning that if the odds ratio is smaller than one, there is a risk reducing effect. If it's larger than one, there is a risk negative effect, meaning that truly we find uh, much more lung cancers in this example. If the odds ratio is zero, there is no association whatsoever in this example. Now come back to confidence intervals. For example, this is the effect of different products, a vaccine or an antibiotic. There's no association at this level. There is a kind of preventive effect at this level and there is a disease effect on that level. P-value would say this has a confidence interval which goes from left to right, crossing the borderline of one p-value, not significant. This is the same, not significant. Statistically spoken, you would not use these products because the effect is not statistically significant, positive or negative. This is quite good. All is less than one in the confidence interval. So that's the good product. No worries about it. This also is a good product. And this is a product with a risk level. So don't use this one. But what about these two? Statistically, no significant effect. So either we throw it in the dustbin 
or we still use it? In what situation would we still use that product? That is, if the proportion depassing the one line is, is uh, small, small as this, because the beneficial effect is much and much greater than the negative effect. This becomes a doubtful product, because if you have a farm with false in this category, and apparently many farms would fall in that category, there is no effect of your antibiotic or of your vaccination. So that's the interpretation of confidence intervals, and we don't, in real life, from an epidemiological point of view, we don't need absolutely this type of product. We are happy and happier if they exist. If they do not exist, we still have a spare option. If this is the best there is and nothing else is available, we can save a lot of trouble on the farms. So p-values in literature studies are not always the things that lead you to the decision, yes or no, I use this product. Confidence intervals are much more useful for that purpose. Yeah, okay, back to the field trial. Treated versus controls. We find for a certain uh, aspects uh, tested in the field trial, otitis media, an odds ratio of 0.84, meaning that it is a reducing effect in the controls, it's a risk increasing effect. That's what we like to see. Daily grow 20 grams higher than the affected ones. Control calves, calves with low IgG and decreased daily growth that uh, we can expect. No association found between disease status and mycoplasma status. That is a repeated observation in the, in the field studies that you don't find a direct causal relationship in the field with prevalence of BRD. But repeatedly tested calves, a small group, still are mycoplasma positive. So those are tested additionally to see what Mycoplasma is doing in that uh, field uh, trial on the, the farms. Again, you find odd ratios as a parameter in uh, different studies where the field is uh, included. Another one, Rexin and other products, 2017. This was feedlot cattle, but just let's try to, uh, to focus on that as well. Five groups. 572 calves, 60 days study duration, a very nice period from a realistic point of view, farm life. Three products, no problem in uh, dry matter intake, no differences in between the groups. The Drexin group, a better daily gain than the other two. Mobility rate was reduced, and again, the Drexin treated calves showed an odds ratio 0 0.36.40, meaning that there was truly a disease-reducing effect. Normally, I should have put behind brackets the confidence interval. And for example, if in this case the confidence interval would be between 0.10 and 0.60, it's a rather small confidence interval that, that does mean that the effect is truly a strong effect. If the confidence interval becomes bigger and bigger, there are other factors involved, most probably. The same can be done for another product. Of course, the same indication. Intermuscularly or subcutaneously, what about clinical effectivity? 60% mortality in controls between five and 10 in treated animals. So there too, there is a strong effect. What 
about the combination because there in feedlot cattle we can have a lot of animals in the same study blinded two protocols the drexin and the XC were needed the interval to separate the potential effect if presence of the specific product the same with another product the same interval and then evaluate the economic and clinical parameters at day 90 that is the study longest duration a study in the field of the longest duration I've ever seen with uh, these uh, BRD problems so in each group over 1,000 animals that's very nice this is the schematic overview either Drexin or Zectran waiting period and treatment only if needed the criteria have been described the, the 10 days interval before starting the observations and the same thing here if needed I continue with an XTD treatment and follow the follow up the same up till 90 days of the study what were the outcomes of this field study direction group at the red side and the exact time group in the, the middle in general a decrease of problems morbidity and, uh, and mortality we have seen the treatment success rates and the need for repeat uh, treatment is different and the advantage is for the, the direction group chronical cases and interval until death survival limits are listed as well so overall less morbidity less mortality less true severe cases better daily weight gain no problem with or no difference between financial revenues for the both groups but the cost for treatment that rejects culling were far less in the direction group and that means that the net economic benefit in this study was about $40 per head higher and again like with the vaccination it shows a direct benefit to the farmer no delay of three to five years to break even so in certain high risk situations with a high infection pressure the combination of Drexin and XCD is highly valuable again you should know the farm you should know the management's uh, characteristics to find out whether it's an average infection type or a highly severe infection type given the risk factors and the management quality may be useful conclusions to find uh, to finish in regular veterinary hotels uh, production management programs vaccination metabolic treatment have their place but take care of the proper indication know the risk factors and the right timing of application that is the interaction between farmer and consulting veterinarian I would suggest train the farmer to do the observations him or herself vaccination has been proven to be always beneficial economically seen if needed you should uh, consider it additional vaccination for example the monhemia other species maybe but then again look for the risk conditions know the management system see what is feasible and see what is economically feasible as well the use of antibiotics must be done in a justified manner if some of you have assisted uh, yesterday in a presentation uh, from Japan about the use of antibiotics in hospital and you see the differences between hospitals which are tremendous you, s you know that there are a lot of things to do yet not only in Japan 
but everywhere else in the world. And I think that the, the lecture of Theo Lam this morning has proven several things for us veterinarians. Always check risk conditions on the farm. I thank you for your attention. I wish you good luck in your daily practice and work. Thank you. Thank you, David Dog. Not uh, So we'd like to have time for Q&A, but we are already uh, beyond my, our time. So uh, uh, sorry for that. So uh, the uh, both um, uh, handout of, uh, of this presentation slides and uh, uh, BRD scoring criteria uh, that was uh, shown in the, uh, his presentation uh, available at uh, our booth. Uh, so please come to uh, our booth to take out. Uh, we Zoites will keep supporting your best BRD control program through our service and our uh, product, products. So thank you very much. Uh, we close the session. Thank you very much.